Welcome back to Element 14 Presents. I'm Andy West, and in today's episode, I'm going to make a 3D graphics card for the Atari 800XL computer out of a Raspberry Pi compute module. Now, to give you some context, the 800XL came out around 1983. Polygon-based 3D graphics didn't really show up in arcades until almost a decade later. In the mid to late 90s, 3D graphics cards for PCs became more common, but there weren't many Atari 8-bit games that attempted 3D, and the ones that did were very limited by the constraints of the hardware. So we're going to give it a boost by letting the Pi do all the heavy lifting. Now just to be clear, I'm not trying to turn this old Atari into a high-end gaming machine. My goal is to be able to render a simple 3D model smoothly and at higher resolution than the Atari can do by itself. Also, I want all the control logic and 3D geometry to reside on the Atari. The point is to simply use the Pi as a graphics accelerator. So do retro 8-bit computers and hardware accelerated 3D graphics mix? Let's find out. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Like most 8 bit computers of the era, the Atari 800 XL had a 6502 processor and was designed to be connected to either a television or a computer monitor. And while it did have a specialized graphics chip called the Color Television Interface Adapter, it was nowhere near powerful enough to render 3D images in real time. So here's what I'm thinking. We'll get ourselves a Compute Module Development Kit and wire the GPIO pins directly to the Atari System Bus via the Parallel Bus Interface. Now, these devices use different voltages, so we'll have to use level shifters, and we'll use the HDMI output on the dev kit to display our 3D scene. The normal video outputs on the Atari will still be available, so we can edit code and display debug output on another monitor. And for input, the computer also has controller ports and is compatible with Atari 2600 game controllers. And I have a couple different types for us to try. On the compute module, our software needs to be real time, and we don't want an operating system taking control over the CPU whenever it wants. So we'll build our rendering engine with the help of Circle, which is a bare metal programming environment for the Raspberry Pi. Finally, on the Atari side, we'll have a small basic program that reads a 3D model from a cartridge and sends the data to the Pi via the parallel interface using a couple of reserved memory addresses. I decided to go with the Compute Module 3 dev kit because it gives us lots of GPIO pins that we need for our interface. So let's open the box and I can show you what it comes with. I'll be honest, I was a little surprised when I got this and discovered that it has both the 3 Plus and 3 Plus Lite boards. Now what's cool about this is we can start with the Lite board, which doesn't have any flash, but it can be wired up to an SD card. And if you look at the development board, uh, you can see that there is in fact an SD card slot. Then once we're done developing our software, we can try flashing the other compute module without the card and see how that goes. Now let's have a look at the back of the Atari. On the far left is a port that says Peripheral, and this is the SIO, or Serial Input Output port. A number of devices were available that use this port, such as the Atari 1010 cassette recorder. But we're more interested in the port labeled Parallel Bus. If we remove this plastic cover, you can see that it's a 50-pin card edge connector. And now the trick is figuring out how to get from here to here. What we'll need is a card edge connector with a 2.54 millimeter pitch, a 50-pin ribbon cable to match, four 8-bit logic level shifters, a breadboard, a bunch of wires, and of course, our dev kit. We're going to start on the Atari side, and for this particular ribbon cable, there's a female IDC connector on both sides, so we want to carefully cut one of those off as straight as we can. Then we get our connector, which comes in two parts. There are these teeth in here that you have to line up with the individual wires in the cable, and if you do it right, they pierce through the insulation and you get connectivity between the wires and the pins. Now maybe I'm doing it wrong, but I'm having to use a hammer to get them to go all the way through. Anyway, this is what it looks like when it's attached, and you can see that it connects nicely to the port. All right, now it's time to refer to some diagrams, because we need to work out which of these pins match to which bus lines. Just looking at the Wikipedia page, I figure we'll need ground, all the address lines A0 through A15, that's for a 16-bit address. Then we'll need the 8 bits of data, D0 through D7. The clock output is going to be important. And finally, we need latch read write. And that tells us whether the current memory address access is a read or a write. Now, Atari did release specifications on how to use this interface, including the rest of these pins I didn't mention. But I've decided to basically ignore all that because even without using Atari's official protocol, we can still wire up the data and address lines and monitor the entire system bus. 
The downside to this approach is that we don't get bi-directional communication or support for multiple devices, but I don't think those features are worth the added complexity for this project. For prototyping, we're just going to take some jumper cables and plug them right into the IDC connector so we can wire it to a breadboard. It's not pretty, but it should do the trick. You'll notice I'm bunching these in groups of 8 because we're using 8-bit level shifters to convert our 5-volt signals to 3.3-volt signals that the Pi can accept. And when we're done, this is what it looks like. The nice thing about using the compute module is that once you're done with the initial prototype, you can design a nice custom board with surface mount components and get rid of all this mess. That's all there really is to the hardware. Let's see if we can get some bare metal code running on the Pi. Do you like winning free stuff? Are you an electronics hobbyist? Do you like building cool projects and winning prizes for what you build? The Element 14 community presents Project 14, the member-driven destination where you decide on the challenge. You enter projects to win monthly prizes and you vote on the winners. What are you waiting for? Join the Element 14 community so you too can enter one of our contests or submit an idea for your own. Join now! Normally I'd consider a single board computer like the Raspberry Pi a poor choice for running time-sensitive code when compared with a microcontroller or FPGA. However, the Pi has graphics acceleration hardware that makes it a better option in this case. As I mentioned before, the problem with running an operating system is that your code can be interrupted at any time by operating system things. The solution to this problem is to write what's called low-level or bare-metal code. Of course, you don't get any handy operating system services like device drivers and task scheduling, but there are programming environments available to give you back some of these features, and one of these environments is called Circle. You can find Circle on GitHub, and for setup information, you'll want to go to the building section of the readme file. I'm primarily a Windows user, and there are instructions for Windows, but I decided to install Circle on a virtual machine running Ubuntu. I installed version 14.04 LTS, and this is very important for reasons I'll explain shortly. Once you've got your VM configured and Circle built, you can download the code for this project at element14.com presents. But before we dive into the code, let's talk about the development workflow. Normally when you're coding for the Raspberry Pi, you can do it right from the Raspberry Pi OS. But since our Pi has no OS, we're going to do something called cross-compilation from Linux. This is how it works. We make our source code changes, build a kernel image using the correct tool chain for our Pi version, copy the image to a shared folder so the host operating system can see it, from the host OS, we copy the image to an SD card with the other required files already prepared, insert the SD card into our development kit, power on the Pi, do some testing, and then start the whole process all over again. Wow, this process is tedious, inefficient, and it's even hard on the SD card. To make my life just a little bit easier, I wrote the graphics code in such a way that it can run on both Ubuntu and the Pi with only minor changes. Circle sample code uses OpenGL ES 1.0, which is very old and is no longer available in Ubuntu, which is why I recommended installing a specific version. You can see here that I'm using preprocessor directives to include different code, depending on whether the environment is Linux or Circle. Now this is only needed in a few specific places. All the other code in the program is identical. Here's a spinning cube demo that shows what I mean. One of these cubes is running in the Linux VM, and the other is a video stream of a program running on the Pi Compute module. The source code for these is 95% the same, and this saved me a ton of time in the early stages of the project. Let's pause for a moment and revisit what we're trying to accomplish on the Pi. So ultimately what we want to do is run a program on the Atari that can ask the Pi to render a 3D scene. So if we say our scene is a cube, for example, then we've got vertices and triangles and all these things that need to be stored in a file in some format. Now that file will be saved on the Atari and the Atari will send the file to the Pi one byte at a time until it's done. Then we can read game controller inputs on the Atari and send those to the Pi as well and move around our scene. So the job of the Pi is to accept commands from the Atari and execute those commands. Now let's take a look at one important part of the code for our Pi-based graphics card. This is the run function, which is part of the C Atari 3D class. Now this class is written with multi-core support, so when the run function is called by the environment, the core number is passed in as an argument. So we've got this switch statement that says for core zero run this code, core one run that code, and then two and three are empty because we're only using two out of our four cores. Core zero has the task of monitoring the Atari system bus for data we're interested in and storing that data in a circular buffer where it can be picked up by core one. 
Now this read all function reads 32 GPIO pins at once and builds a single 32-bit value from the results. And then down here, we're masking 16 of those 32 bits to use as an address. Now this only works because I carefully hardwired the first 16 GPIO pins to the address lines of the Atari. What this line basically says is if the Atari is writing a value to hex address 680, then we should store that value. And hex 680 was chosen because it's protected from use by the Atari OS. That means if a value is written there, it was done by our code on the Atari. And core one has a much harder job. It has to take the bytes stored by core zero and interpret them as commands for rendering graphics. So there's commands for setting colors, creating triangle vertices, moving the camera, and more. I'm not gonna get into the rest of the code because it's mostly OpenGL initialization, window management, and other things that aren't very interesting. If we wanted, we could build and run it on the Pi right now, but it wouldn't do anything yet. First, we need to create a 3D scene, store it on the Atari, and then send the scene data from the Atari to the Pi to start rendering. I wanted to create a simple scene in Blender with a very low poly count that's still interesting to look at, so I built this city block. The entire thing is made up of cubes and planes, and you can see when I click on different objects, they have materials with different names like tree leaves and windows and so on, and also the base color varies as well. It's very important that the geometry be as clean as possible and that all the normals are facing the right direction or it won't render properly on the Raspberry Pi. When we're done, we wanna export this as an OBJ file so that we can parse it easily and convert it into a custom format. Here's what the exported file looks like. So there's different prefixes, V for vertex, F for face, and you can also see with the material names I've manually appended the hex value of the color. That's not something done by Blender. I, I entered those manually. And that's to assist the conversion tool, which we're gonna look at now. This is a bit of C-sharp code that takes the exported OBJ file we were just looking at. And this is where I handle the different types of data. V creates new vertex coordinates. And for G, we split off the hex color value that I typed in earlier. After I've built up all the triangles in memory, I write them out to a new file in a custom minimal binary format. The binary file is only six kilobytes in size, which is important because we're gonna save this on a special writable cartridge, along with some basic code that we're gonna write right now. Programming the Atari XL to load our 3D model and send it to the Pi is relatively easy because we can use an emulator. Now that's not to say you couldn't program it directly, but I just find it much faster to code on the PC. I went with Atari's built-in basic language. It's slow, but very simple to use, and I was able to fit everything I needed into fewer than 40 lines of code. In fact, the file transfer is accomplished in only eight lines. At the top of the listing, we open the file, then we loop through every byte and poke it into memory location 1664. And this is the decimal equivalent of hex 680, which you recall is the memory location we're monitoring on the Pi. After the file sent, we watch for controller input. Atari actually made a driving controller for the 2600 game console, and it has a spinning wheel and a button, and I thought this would be appropriate for navigating our city scene. When you spin the wheel, the basic stick function cycles through different values. And you can tell from the transitions, for example, 12 to 14 or 14 to 15, uh, which direction the wheel's turning. And again, we poke those values into location 1664 in memory to signal to the Pi that we've received the input. The emulator has a cool feature called Disk Explorer that lets you manipulate an ATR disk image. Here's the city.base we've been looking at, which I saved previously, and also city.bin, which is the 3D model I imported by right-clicking and selecting Import File. If you have an Atari floppy disk drive or cassette tape drive, those should work perfectly fine for storing your files. But I'm gonna use a special device called the Atari Max Flash Cart. There's the cartridge itself and then a USB-based programmer. And what you do is you choose your disk image file and write it to the cart in one of the slots. Now this actually supports multiple disk images on a single cartridge, so it creates this menu for you automatically. Then you just insert the cartridge in the cartridge slot like any game you might have had back in the day, power on the Atari and select your image, and you're ready to go. All right, now we've got all the parts in place, let's test it out. We've selected a disk image on the Atari, so now we type in the command that loads our basic program. Okay, and then the Pi goes on, and it's waiting to receive data. So we'll type run to start our program. And there we, there we go, you can see each byte as it's received. Now this takes a minute or two. And there it is, our city block. All right, so I've got this set up, so if you press the button, you move forward, and turning the wheel should steer. It's, you know, it's not very responsive because Atari Basic is, well, incredibly slow. 
But you can see how, how this could be turned into an interesting game if you added more objects, some sort of goal, maybe like a scoring system. Uh, and of course you could always rewrite the Atari code in assembly language if you wanted it to be faster. That's all we have for today. Have you ever tried to combine old and current technologies to create something new? Let us know on the Element 14 community at element14.com presents, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.